Welcome to the Level Up Artist Podcast. We're your hosts, Adriana M.A. and Jackie Sanders. We are two art professionals sharing for the advice and business lessons we have learned along our creative journeys. We talk to artists, leaders, and art professionals to demystify the creative process and discover new ways to succeed as a career-minded artist. If you find value in these conversations, please go ahead and subscribe. This will help other creatives like you find our podcast and you'll be notified when we drop new episodes every Tuesday. On today's episode, we're excited to welcome artist and sculptor Ivana Milievich Beck. Welcome, Ivana. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation with you. Of course, we are so excited. Some things we're going to talk about is really just diving into your artistic journey, the stories and memories embedded in your sculptures, as well as recording a bonus segment on developing your artistic style for our podcast supporters over at leveluparticist.com. But before we dive into that fun conversation, let's share a little bit about you and your background for our listeners who might not be familiar with you and your work. So Ivana is a Serbian sculptor, primarily working with brick, wax, and mortar. She is a part of the City Market Artist Collective Gallery in downtown Raleigh, just around the corner from us over at Artspace. Um, in 2016, she received a Master of Fine Arts in Studio Art from UNCG. She has exhibited in various prestigious institutions, including the Mint Museum. She teaches at Wake Tech College and soon will start at Meredith College, has been a resident artist for Artspace and Barton College, among others, has received accolades from various institutions institutions, including the International Sculpture Center, and has been featured in publications such as Sculpture Magazine. Being from Serbia and living in America, her work addresses how her cultural, social, and psychological foundations have shifted since she left her home, family, and friends back in Serbia. She perceives brick as the foundational material for home building, as well as a metaphor for the people who were responsible for her own groundwork. Through material synthesis, such as wax and brick, her intent is in bringing together what is fragile, delicate, and ephemeral with that which is strong, durable, and unbreakable. And of course, that is a very formal introduction for our listeners, Ivana, but how would you describe your artwork to someone who has never seen it before? Wow, so um, that is, a, it's impossible to do in a, you know, as I say, give me an elevator, elevator speech. Um, I remember when I was back in UNC Greensboro and uh, our professors would often ask us, you know, give me the elevator speech. You know, if someone just asks you, like, what is your art about? Um, well, I was never good in that, even <laughs> today, you know, I, I kind of struggle. I'm sort of like a deer when he faces the very bright lights, I kind of freeze. So I'm having difficulty explaining that uh, in, a, in a brief sentence. Um, I mean, after all, it took me a few years to come up with my, uh, you know, concept. And so it's really kind of hard to, to, you know, forget about my mind works that way that I just know all of these bits and pieces that went into it. So, it, you know, you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yep. Yep, we do. And to give folks a visual and then fill us in, you know, additional details as you feel um, are pertinent. I think the easiest way to describe it to someone who may be listening in their car, right, to this podcast episode is we have forms that involve bricks and then there's curves with wax that are holding some of these brick type pieces in place. So you can look and it can look like a sensuous curve, but when you look a little closer, it's bricks and wax and maybe some other materials involved. Do you think that sort of kind of helps give a description? Um, you see, that, that's a problem with uh, me and my mind. I just, I get things very complicated in my mind. So but actually really describing it in a, in a very, you know, simple term, uh, brick coming together, uh, you know, in this amalgam with a with a, uh, wax part that is sort of representing the body. Um, and um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I can say a few words uh, about the concept uh, if you want me to. Um, again, you mentioned I'm from Serbia, and um, I've been living here in America for 20 years. So when I was back in school in UC Greensboro, I had plenty of time. I had two years to really dig into the concept and try to figure out what am I really passionate about, what I want to, um, you know, devote my life, what I want to make. Um, and um, so obviously the big change in my life was coming over here to live and, you know, being faced with different uh, culture and surroundings. And so um, naturally I started thinking about that. And, and you know, after a year or so, I uh, dug into some memories back in Serbia living as a child. Um, I came here uh, when I was 25, um, still pretty young and uh, <laughs> not knowing what I'm doing. Um, 
So I sort of found myself between these two spaces. Uh, been living in America, thinking about Serbia. So even though physically I was here in one place, mentally I was there. So naturally I started thinking about the relationship of the body and mind sort of being you know, like stretched out between the two spaces. And just, uh, and that's how eventually I um, started, I, I chose brick because brick is something that I remember as a material that people would make houses back in Serbia and they would often have them lay in front of the houses or uh, they're about to make them, to make the house, build the house or, or they're leftover bricks. So, and then of course, playing as a kid and using that as a sort of chalk to write with, mm-hmm. or, um, you know, so, um, and so, so brick is symbolic of home um, and here in America and in Serbia and then wax because of the nature and characteristics of the material itself, this ability to change and fuse, to change its form uh, under the pressure, under the you know heat. Um, I thought that was a perfect material to incorporate with a brick. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I do wanna take us on the time machine for a quick second with something that you mentioned. So you mentioned, you know, seeing the bricks and houses being built in Serbia, but I actually have a question. Um, I think Serbia is one of those interesting countries because it has a mix of Roman and Byzantine. So Eastern and when Eastern and Western ancient civilizations and empires and things like that. Plus it has a lot of museums. Like I looked it up and I'm like, oh my gosh, Serbia has a lot of museums. Um, was any of that ancient art or any of the art in the museums also part of your inspiration when you were growing up? Or was it you were more interested in the bricks than the quote unquote fine art? Just curious to see, you know, kind of how that came into. Sure. So it's interesting because, um, you know, prior to coming to, to America, I never even dreamed about becoming an artist. You know, I never, uh, well, actually, that's not true. <laughs> Sorry. It is actually, uh, I had that in my mind. I just never thought it would be possible for me at that time, living in Serbia. So what happened is when I was finishing high school, um, I st- prior to finishing high school, I would do, at a free time, I would do a lot of drawings and these drawings would be mainly of the female bodies. It was more in terms of like um, dressing up these, you know, bodies and uh, thinking about the fashion. So I was more inspired um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, how can I create a new outfit? That was my, but I really remember enjoying that a lot. So, um, and then later when I finished high school, uh, naturally I was thinking about going to college and um, I wanted to go uh, to college to, to, to become a painter. You know, I, I love the drawings, but I love, I love paint too. But interestingly, you know, I, I never thought of sculpture, never. <laughs> so the only time as a kid remember and remembering, you know, seeing sculpture, uh, would be uh, monuments that we would go and visit, um, you know, throughout the Serbia or uh, across from the building where I live to this day and where I grew up. It's a national park. Uh, this wooded area that has a lot of monuments that, um, uh, you know, that are symbolic, they're standing there for suffering from the World War I. Um, so I grew up for 25 years walking through those areas and seeing these monuments. So um that would be you know the extent so I never it's to me it's also kind of you know crazy to think that I really on my own really didn't go that much into the museums or um uh, so 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 only coming back to uh, here to America uh, of course um, I'm jumping ahead but I just want to say that when I brought up the question um to myself never to my parents um about possibly going to Belgrade to study because that's where they have a good school for, you know, to, uh, for paint, sculpture. And um, I just all, it was all internal, never reached out to anyone to ask for advice, never shared my thoughts with anyone because I, I knew it was impossible, you know, because we didn't have money. I knew I didn't want to put my parents through the trouble of even, you know, thinking about it. So I just dismissed that um, uh, dream of mine, you know, because I was really, I just knew it was just impossible for me to, because of the situation that we're in. So, so that was that. I kind of left it there and totally, you know, it was, of course, it's part of me. I never forgot about it. And so (laughs) my sculpture was never, you know, on my mind, to to be honest with you. And um, so coming here and then um, living here for a while, getting married. So I came in 2003, got married pretty soon, a year later, 2004. And then slowly sort of uh, just first of all, enjoying just the culture, being here, getting adapted to the new environment. And then um, suddenly realizing, oh my God, I can go to school. I can transfer my credits. And uh, so that got me really excited. 
And even then, you know, I, I talked to my husband, what can I do? What, you know, what would be, he said, you know, I think, and actually I came out with advertising. Oh. And, yeah. And so to me, the way I imagined this was, you know, getting a poster and kind of organizing all of the elements there on the page, <laughs> and playing with color and other things that, that was, you know, my understanding. And, um, and he was like, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then of course we looked at the school that was the closest, that was UNC Greensboro and a really great school, awesome school. Um, first I went to Forsyth Tech, which is in mm-hmm. Mississippi, uh, took the core classes and I still remember the day, you know, when I got into the school, it was 2009, I got admitted and I just couldn't believe, you know, because it, it just, it's all, sometimes it just all seems like a dream to me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I think about, you know how it is sometimes, I don't know if you ever do this, but for example, um, you're going to see a new place and that you're very excited about. And um, you suddenly start imagining how this place looks like, you know? So you create in your head specific type of feeling, the way the place looks, and then you go there and then you get a totally new feeling, right? And it is so interesting to kind of, you know, compare these two things. So when I was back in, you know, in Serbia, when, when this possibility uh, came, that uh, the opportunity for me to come to America, um, you know, I started imagining, oh my God, just imagine, you know, I'm barely speaking Serbian. How am I going to study, you know, and live, to live there and study, for example, um, in English? To me, that was impossible. <laughs> you know, so now thinking that I am actually teaching, you know, to me, and it's still my English is still evolving. Yeah, I still make mistakes. I'm still, you know, especially when I'm very self-conscious, I, I start making mistakes um, as I get relaxed, which you will see probably a little later. <laughs> Then things get to flow more with ease and um, natural. But I'm uh, sorry, I'm digressing a lot. Um, so anyway, I finally got into University of Greensboro and I actually decided to go for a graphic design major. Mm-hmm. And again, even with that, I, I, I thought that uh, using graphic pencil, right, that would be what I will be doing and, you know, other things too, but all on paper. Uh, obviously, that was something that I wanted to do. Uh, but, um, you know, we had a few classes that were really like that. And the rest was on a very was digital, which I didn't like. Yeah. And especially from an advertising graphic design. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of people go into that field or that industry thinking it you're hyper creative all the time. Like you're saying, it's very tactile, organizing elements of design. And there is an aspect of that, but a lot of it can be more of the business side of working with clients and a lot of it's very digital, which is a very different industry than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm curious with your creative process now and with, of course, getting that formal education, which is very impressive, coming to a brand new country, learning a different language, that has so many hurdles that you overcame. And then now being a teacher is incredible. Um, but with your creative process now, I think it's really interesting how you were saying initially you never really thought about sculpture and you thought about just drawings or paintings. Um, but your process now does include all of those elements, correct? In various ways. And like, what role do each of those pieces play in your creative process? Um, so, you know, you, you, you're talking about, um, uh, drawing to combine yeah. mm-hmm. yeah. right like do they start as preliminary sketches and then you use the sketches to make your sculpture or do you envision them as ice their own pieces within themselves just different mediums sure yes so so first of all at the beginning I started using sketching sketches mainly as a sort of developing the idea for sculptures um so that was at the beginning and and then uh later uh, at a certain point in time, I was not able to go to my studio here in my backyard to do to make sculptures. So I was very frustrated, and of course, I had to uh, continue working on something. So I, I went back to these drawings, and uh, they just started getting developed more and more. So I started spending all of this time just with the drawings, and they sort of took off, and and now they they stand on their own, mm-hmm. you know. That's, drawings and um so and that's i think it's very you know i'm I'm trying to be observant as much as i can uh what does the drawing do and what does the drawing allows me to do it's it's so much more um intuitive not the sculpture is not sculpture is also very intuitive 
uh, to when I'm creating and but the drawing it just there is no maybe it's because of I think it's also the medium right mm -hmm. that is so direct and there is no fear of even if there's a mistake great you know I um uh, I just go on that's another challenge uh, that would move me in certain direction um another step in, in the making uh, whereas with brick and wax I think because um the process it's not so um uh, quick I have a lot of room to think about and sometimes that can stop me from making mm -hmm. so I have to be very careful, you know, like I have constantly to be here. It's just so weird because you have to balance it, you know, so many, you have your own self, your own mind that can get in the way of mm -hmm. making. So I need to keep that in check and, and allow for creative process to happen and, and just trust and follow and just keep making like, hey, keep myself in check constantly, you know, it just, it's just so hard, especially now when I don't have that much time um that I when I go it's there's this need okay you need to make you need to make you know there's this pressure things have to be made um so again it's it's frustrating but what you know I just need to what we do <laughs> we don't make it easy I mean it's part of what makes it so challenging and so exciting it's I feel like in many ways and other artists on the podcast have you know echoed this thought too it's like we're troubleshooters. We we are problem solvers. So we create the problem and then we have to solve it. Um, but like you said, it's like getting out of our own way to not make so many problems that we don't even know what to solve first. You know, yeah. we got to pick some priorities. Um, so no, I absolutely love that. And I love that idea too, of how the paintings and the and the drawings can let you kind of flush out some of those ideas and then you can go back and pick from there what you want to turn, what of the 2D do you want to develop 3D while still being intuitive in the 3D, but like they're they're like feeding each other, essentially, mm -hmm. like they're in, in combination with each other. So I absolutely love that. Um, question about materials for you. So conceptually, it makes a lot of sense. You explained to us earlier, kind of like where the bricks and wax are coming from and what you're trying to um, communicate through some of that. But I'm curious when you were in that journey learning sculpture, you know, back in school, were there other materials you were drawn to first before you reached, you know, brick or was brick like love at first sight or how did you come to that? Yeah, yeah, that was a really fun time. And, you know, again, just a little bit frustrating too, uh, but mostly fun. You know, I, I when I started um, uh, undergraduate school, uh, first I was upstairs doing my digital work, doing a little bit of graphic design. Um, and then I'm like, okay, let me venture downstairs in the foundry and see what's going on there. So I went down there and uh, I discovered welding. So that was the first class that I uh, took there, uh, welding class. And that really made me feel so powerful, you okay. know, as a woman using that uh, welding machine and doing my first weld. I still remember, you know, doing it so well. And you know how it is. It just, um, it could be that, you know, maybe if I didn't do so good, maybe I will be discouraged and say, hey, you know, I i don't. But anyway, I had a great experience. And then I kind of started venturing outside of the metal studio, trying to figure out what's out there, uh, what else is out there. And sure enough, there's a ceramic studio, there's wood working shop. So I ended up, you know, making pieces in wood and making pieces in ceramics. And during that time, I really, concept was nowhere in place for me. It was mostly just dealing with materials, right? And not even, you know, digging deeper, like, oh, nature of this material, what are the characteristics? But really just learning the basics. And I think, of course, that's where you have to start. And then things will slowly, you know, at least for me, that's that's how my brain works. And uh, so, so yes, I work with wood, with metal, and, um, of course, noticing what can I do in wood uh, versus what can I do in metal, you know, using this metal uh this welding machine to quickly sort of you know tag these pieces together and have a very quickly piece you know whereas wood what i need to do you know the piece have to be cut it takes time to glue them together and so just really not not maybe even being aware of that but really taking in that process of what it takes to make to work with different mediums and it was then later when i went to graduate school then even for the first year, I went crazy exploring <laughs> materials, like working a little bit with wax, with cotton balls, with uh, woven vinyl, woven vinyl, which is this um, a black mesh. 
a plastic match um, that you can get in Home Depot. Of course, Home Depot was my store. So, <laughs> you know, got a big roll of that thing and uh, started creating, like starting to kind of, I start playing with it. I start playing with that, you know, kind of like rolling them around like really tightly. And it becomes this beautiful, shiny material. It's just amazing, you know. And this thing is used to hold up the pipes. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, so just to mention a few of those materials. And then when I kind of got it all out and I was like, okay, so I think I had a plenty of experimentation bags and other things. I think it's really obvious what I need to do. I mean, I really need to uh, get myself a concept. Like what, what am I working? What is this all, you know, where is this all going? And that's when I said, okay, so what is, I literally, I was sitting in my studio. I said, okay, so what is one thing that has impacted me, my life, uh, you know, tremendously since I came here? I was like, well, that's, that's what it is coming here and remembering those feelings because my English was very bad. And, uh, I just, I was very shy to talk, uh, embarrassed. And so I just felt like, um, prisoner in my own body. Um, and so I started from there and then of course, slowly I started having all of these different memories, you know, from the childhood and thinking about my grandparents and my friends and everything that was foundational to me, for me, um, back in Serbia and sort of trying to rebuild, create something similar here as well. Mm. I absolutely love that, especially from the academia exploration standpoint. I think you touched on something that's super important of, I think often, especially as younger artists or emerging artists or any artist who's really looking to find their voice, there can be a lot of pressure on what you are saying with your work, which is definitely a huge part of the creative process. But I love you just sharing the material exploration and having that playfulness with it, which I used to have a professor, he used to always say, the best art store is a hardware store. <laughs> and going, I do that all the time as well, going in to Lowe's, and like thinking, okay, this is a very functional material meant for one thing. How can I completely put it in a new environment and make it something else? Which is a lot of fun also talking to people that work there. They're saying like, you're trying to do what? And you're like, <laughs> trust me, it's gonna work. I just need this, this, and this. Yeah. Um, but really leaning into that exploration and questioning of materials, exploring how they work together and then bringing in that okay, well, this is what I am naturally gravitating towards in my style, in my materials that I like using. Now, what does that mean to me? Because I think oftentimes that symbolism and meaning can sometimes be something that we don't even understand at first. But like, why am I drawn towards bricks? Why am I drawn towards these contrasting colors or these contrasting texture of material? And then that's where that fun introspection comes in, which as you touched on, and as we'll dive into, is that's where the rich fun of the creative process can come in of learning the stories of other artists. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love into how like part of what you're mentioning, something I'm grabbing from it is you didn't rush it. So I feel like a lot of times artists will find maybe a little bit of success with something small and they're like, I have to find my niche and I have to stay in it. And it's either that or it's completely shiny object syndrome. New thing, new thing, new thing. It's like either one it doesn't allow for the time, which is what you were giving it, to actually learn the material and then be like, do I like this or not? Does this help me convey what I want to say through the art while having a process that's challenging but also enjoyable? So I loved mm -hmm. how you mentioned that and I love how you went through all the different materials. Um, I don't know. I feel like it it definitely is important, you know, to do that, but also to give it time and then to go back and just kind of observe and evaluate and say which one which one resonates the most knowing, and this is something, you know, that I had to learn myself because I get the shiny object syndrome. Um, but I had a mentor early on who was like, you can always go back. So just because like in your case, you tried metals, you know, at the beginning and then you moved to cotton balls and then you moved to brick and all the other different things in between doesn't mean that Ivana won't be making metal sculptures 10 years from now. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's more of what, what fits the best now after giving it a good old try knowing that even if you put the other things aside, you can always bring them back or incorporate them somehow. So I really love that you mentioned that. Um, I also have to, you know, give you props. You mentioned about moving to the States, same, right? Like already as an adult, different language, different food, different weather, different culture. There's so much that happens, you know? Um, and then 
trying to bring some of that through also in a way that resonates with the people around you. You know, it can't, I mean, it can, but I don't know, it's kind of hard sometimes to just make it about something from back home that only people from a specific place will get. But it's yeah. almost like if the art is so personal and it's so vulnerable, it actually becomes universal and it doesn't matter where you're from or the person viewing it. It doesn't matter where they're from either. They could be from something completely different and they still get it. But um, I think you kind of answered this a little bit already, but I was curious to see for you, do you think that the move itself um, has had a big impact with the way that you wanted to portray your artwork? Or even the materials themselves? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the concept came out of, you know, that, um, that just being apart away from my foundation. And so how do I rebuild it, you know, here? Um, so definitely, I mean, it has triggered, it, it gave me something to to work you know towards here in my art to try to i mean I'm, i think i'm really trying to figure out you know like here of course you can we continue to learn as we grow about ourselves but you know how how am i you know how am i living here am i happy here you know what are what is the what is the future going to look like i mean nobody knows that um uh, what is now um, you know, I don't know. It's um, it, it definitely in terms of con concept, you know, has impacted me uh, big time. Move over here. It's a it's a big step, and um, so I'm just uh, slowly with my art trying to figure some things out. And I'd say you're def definitely doing a good job of that, especially hearing as you talked in the beginning of those that symbolism with the materials that you use in many of your sculptures now, of course, as we've talked about, it's evolved over time. Um, but I love that idea of like the bricks being the grounding of home and the connection of these two places. And then in a way, those wax organic forms that are absolutely beautiful for our listeners, if they haven't seen your work. Not if you're driving, of course, but please go check out Ivana's work because it's absolutely stunning. And simplistic and yet so complex at the same time um and I'm curious especially when it comes to the wax portion of your figures there's beautiful curves beautiful shapes definitely suggesting towards a figure especially a woman figure um so is there a direct connection between the wax forms and womanhood do you see yourself in those sculptures or a little bit more removed from it you know at the beginning when I started making them uh, you know, obviously they were symbolic of the body and, and obviously symbolic of my body too. So, um, so yeah, in some ways they are sort of autobiographical. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but, um, you know, it, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the maker of this piece. So this is about my life and my situation. And uh, so definitely uh, they are, you know, about me, um, about my body um yeah cool perfect I love that I love that yeah it's like not they're not necessarily as obvious at first but there's definitely some of the forms where you look and you're like that kind of looks like could be a person or the curves of a person so they're they're very intriguing for sure for sure um now Ivana what kind of stories or memories do you hope to convey with your sculptures for say generations to come, you know, somebody else years down the road, whether it's your daughter or your descendants, right? Um, or a viewer, you know, down the road, looking at your work, um, what kind of stories or memories do you hope to convey with them? Uh, okay, let's see. Well, you know, I, I do want it to be sort of hopeful, you know, um, uh, obviously they are about my struggle, right? between the being the in this place and, and I don't say I am I'm having good time here you know this is my new home so in any way is that I'm complaining or it's not that but it's you know naturally as you know you know you're missing the place of your birth you're missing that's that's where everything started so um but you know I think this and it goes the work evolves and I think it goes beyond just that was the beginning right the concept that that kind of started that made me started making these um, uh, organic forms and uh, they refer to the body and, and partially to the place too. Um, but also it's about, you know, daily life and struggle as a woman. 
as a mother. Um, and of course, I have a daughter too. So I think, you know, I often think about her, you know, she's half American, half Serbian. So she goes to visit Serbia too. So I think that she also has this sort of, um, you know, like a split in her personality, but, you know, she sees it both through her own experiences and she sees it through me, my work. And um, uh, so what am I trying? I don't know. It's a, it's a really hard question to answer. You know, I'm, I don't know how to answer this question. I mean, I, no, I this is perfect. This is perfect. I, I think you, you answered it perfectly. It's almost that story of overcoming. You know, it's like you're coming to a new place, you know, whether folks are, you know, going across the pond, so to speak, or moving cities or whatever the case may be. Um, It's that story of like, you know, you're facing these challenges. Perhaps at first you don't even know how to tackle it, but you just keep working through it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, what a great role model to your daughter, really, of like, you can, you can face these things and overcome them. And like you said, not only did you come over already as an adult, but you got yourself in school and you graduated and you do beautiful work and now you teach too. It's like, no, you're, you're showing like it is possible. Like you're, you're being a role model too for other folks that then get to learn your story and the sculpture might be the first way that they learn about you through that. So very, very inspiring. I'm like, what's well, very you. emotional. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, the teary eyed one. Um, <clears throat> but um, one of the questions, um, you know, going into one of the questions we like to ask all our guests, um, Ivana, how do you define success as an artist? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, you know, um, if you, if you ask, if you have asked me this, you know, maybe a few years back, it would be probably you know, going, oh, getting, you know, maybe a solo show here in this gallery or this, and or getting to the museum. And, um, but, but, you know, these days it's mostly just, I feel successful if I spend time in my studio, if I get to enter the studio and spend, a, spend at least two or three hours in the studio. And then even more success comes if I'm able to continue that every day. Um, so it's really, really, you know, I'm struggling with that because I, you know, I'm working um, full time and as an adjunct. So and and so it's really, um, you know, I'm spread thin. I I'm frustrated that I can that I don't have time to make. And, and of course, you know, there's a family time. Uh, you know, I forget about me. I don't even think about me. You know, so me, I think me is you know sculptor. So. Um, so if I get to come to the studio, and even if I'm just in here, just take it, take it all in, looking, you know, the things that I left last time here, and trying, you know, to kind of just to keep in touch, you know, that that's the that's the biggest thing for me. Absolutely love that, especially as you are experiencing, and so many of us are of balancing those many hats we all wear, the juggling priorities. Um, so anytime you can find time to get in your studio, it's a good day. <laughs> Now, what is one piece of advice that you wish you had heard before you got started on your creative journey? Okay, so let's see. So uh, a few things. Uh, first of all, when I when I had my daughter, uh, prior to that, I had so much time to work on on my art, and you know, you maybe sometimes you take that for granted. Um, but uh, once when I had my daughter, you know, again, this is maybe all individual, but I I you know that whole process of just you know, becoming a mother, it was just very hard on me and emotionally and physically. So, um, but, but looking at other artist friends who also had, and this is not to compare, I'm not giving myself a hard time now, but um, I, what I'm trying to, uh, to say is that even if you have 15 minutes a day, you know, if you take the drawing pad, do a little sketch, whatever, to get your idea, uh, ideas down, uh, it's very important. Again, I'm going back to that, you know, relationship uh, with art, you know, keeping in touch. And, and that's something, you know, when I look at back, I'm like, you know, really, I know I, I, I had to take care of the of things back then, but if I just, you know, spent every day, just even 15 minutes, and that's something I didn't know, you know, it was only after that I realized, you know, how much time. And so, of course, I'm taking that advice you know, today too. And I just said, I don't, even if I come here, have 15 minutes, I would, you know, read a chapter of the book, something related to art, or just come in here, hang out with my art, or um, anything to to just maintain that. 
I love that. Yeah. It's that idea of having a daily practice or as close as you can get and keep the, keep the creative engine running. Um, don't let it idle or another comparison people do. It's like a muscle. You have to work it out. Otherwise, you know, otherwise it takes longer for it to get to where you want it to be. But the good thing is it doesn't go away regardless. It just might be harder to get it back, but it's not gone, gone, even if you haven't done it for a while. So I love that, you know, that idea. And then I think I would add to that too. Um, I guess to tell your younger self of it is possible. (laughs) You had mentioned, you know, growing up thinking, I didn't think that was a thing. Um, you know, to have this kind of life and career. So that's trust yourself, trust your vision, you know. It's of course it's always easier to say when you go through some things, you know, Mm -hmm. hey, but um, yeah, that's another advice, you know, just don't be hard on yourself. Uh, if you're really if you want to be an artist, just show up every day work on your things, um, use any, any, even if you have, like I said, 15 minutes, just do a little, write down something to kind of pause it in your brain, you know, that you'll come back later to follow up. It's very important. That's perfect. Now, Ivana, if somebody randomly handed you a hundred bucks, what would you splurge it on or invest in? It has to be something that brings you joy and relates to your art or business. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So you know, I've been thinking for a while that it would be nice for me to be a student myself. Um, so I think maybe if there's a workshop that I can go to, I think that would be a good hundred dollars spent, you know, um, to just, to, I think I, I just feel like I need to, I need a focus and in being somewhere where someone, you know, not that they will tell you do this or that, but I feel like the workshop will concentrate and specifically I'm thinking about something with paper, you know, creating forms in paper. That's something that has been on my mind lately. So I think having something like that would be great. Um, I know it will be interesting to, you know, I, I would probably, I love to buy sketchbooks, even though I have plenty of them. I love sketchbooks. So that's another thing, you know, or art books or, um, or maybe even giving, you know, finding four friends, splitting the money, giving the money and saying, hey, you know, go buy something. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's that's perfect. My brain went to first, like how many bricks can you buy with a hundred dollars? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I like yeah. your answer so much better for sure. <laughs> I'll get bring, bricks somewhere else. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's there are so many uh, houses, you know, falling apart these days. So you can get them for free. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Constantly scavenging. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I love to look in the trash. <laughs> That's what I used to do at uh, school, uh, in a workshop. And, yeah. uh, I did find, um, this hundred year old from tobacco, a piece of wood. It was, I mean, beautiful, dark, the rings are just so. I still have pieces here at home. So that's, that's perfect. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, Ivana, you mentioned you'll be teaching at Wake Tech soon. I mean, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. You'll be teaching at Meredith soon. Um, yeah. So that's super exciting coming up. Are you going to be teaching graphic design? Uh, no, I will be teaching 3D, uh, two 3D classes, 3D, 3D design. Ooh, that sounds amazing. Um, besides those upcoming classes, do you have any other exciting projects or events that uh, that you want to share with our listeners? Uh, well, I have, um, I'm getting ready for a, a show, group show, a Durham Art Guild with three other ladies. And uh, that's, the opening is June 10th, so... I need to um, for our local listeners, they can definitely come by for the Durham Art Guild opening. That'll be great. We'll make sure that all the information for that is in our episode show notes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, Ivana, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. This has been such a fun conversation. Real quick before we go, though, how can listeners stay in contact with you after they listen to today's episode and potentially get more information about that upcoming exhibition and new pieces you have in the works? Sure. Um, so, uh, I would say probably Instagram would be probably the best. Um, so Ivana M back, I V A N A M B C K. And also it could uh, city market artist collective.com. That's another one. Uh, of course I have my own website. Um, and, um, but it hasn't been updated <laughs> since 2017. So that's, you know, but I think for the most updates, uh, it will be Instagram. That will be the best. Perfect. We'll make sure to link all those things in the show notes. Um, before we go, uh, we'd love to have you stay with us a few extra minutes so we can develop, we can discuss your tips for 
developing artistic style uh, for the bonus segment for our podcast supporters. Do you have a few more minutes? Yes, sure. Thank you. Excellent. So for our listeners, if you want to become a podcast supporter, you can head on over to leveluparist.com and find out how you too can support the Level Up Artist podcast. And if you want to stay connected with us in between episodes, share your feedback, or have a question you would like for us to answer on the podcast, you can reach us through social media. I'm at Amaya Art across all platforms. And I'm at J Sanders Studio on all platforms. And if you want to follow the podcast, we are at Level Up Artists on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.